Meningitis can be challenging because the signs and symptoms are relatively nonspecific. If we're talking about a child who has a fever, irritability, decreased activity, sure, that could be bacterial meningitis, but that could also be due to uh, some bad virus. We went to three hospitals before and they just said that she had normal temperature, that it was a flu that will go away in seven days. It didn't go away. She was seizing. Temperature was 106.6. I was so scared and we were in the ambulance, I don't know what to do. Even amongst people who work in the medical field, uh, the limits of what we can prevent is not always understood because even though we have vaccines for some types of meningitis, they won't cover against all the types, they don't work in everyone, and there are certain age groups or certain populations who are uniquely at risk of certain types of meningitis. Texas Children's Hospital is a big tertiary referral center, so we tend to see a lot of cases of things that other people maybe only see once or twice in their career. Certainly the most common type of meningitis is going to be viral meningitis, and that's going to be primarily of the enteroviral family. And unfortunately we also see other forms of viral meningitis which are more severe. The most common of our bacterial types of meningitis uh, are related to streptococcus pneumoniae or pneumococcal meningitis, and we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 15 cases of pneumococcal meningitis each year at Texas Children's. We've also had a few cases of salmonella meningitis in maybe older uh, infants and younger children. There have been uh, a handful of cases of gram-negative meningitis, E. coli meningitis. I think. Certainly one of the uh, factors related to an increased incidence of bacterial meningitis and probably viral meningitis as well in young children is their relative immaturity of their immune system. We certainly know that antibody to the capsular uh, polysaccharides of the major bacterial organisms, pneumococcus, meningococcus, and haemophilus influenza type B, are protective and are the most important factors in having the host be able to prevent these infections. The antibody is typically transported across the placenta to the infant so that they're protected for some period of time, maybe two or three or four months. But as that antibody wanes, the baby has not yet developed their own antibody, so the infants are gonna be at increased risk for the development of these bacterial meningitis syndromes. Similarly, there perhaps lymphocytes are not as effective in protecting them against uh, viruses that might cause viral meningitis. In the neonatal population, which are the very young infants, we see different types of meningitis. We see a lot of group B strep meningitis, um, and both early onset and late onset. And one of the great successes, if you like, in terms of a group B strep treatment is that we know that by screening women for group B strep and by giving them antibiotics if they're positive while they're in labor, uh, you can prevent a lot of cases of early onset disease. For example, before intrapartum chemoprophylaxis was recommended, about 1 in 1.7 to 2 per 100,000 infants born got early onset disease. And since we've started screening and have a protocol for treating women who may be at risk of giving, and infants who may be at risk of group B strep, this disease rate has gone down to about 0.2 to 0.3 per thousand. So that's a great decrease. Other forms of meningitis that we certainly see in the neonate are group B streptococcus, as well as some other maybe hospital-acquired types of bacteria if kids have some underlying conditions, especially if they require a VP shunt or they have an extraventricular drain in an EVD because of issues related to hydrocephalus. It was surprising to me that she, w she had meningitis. I think when she was born, she had got her meningitis shot. I was surprised that it took me about three hospitals to get to here to know that she had meningitis and everywhere we went, oh no, she's fine, she's fine, she'll be okay, you can go home. This child actually had received two doses of the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, the 13-valent vaccine, 
but has disease due to a serotype that's not in the vaccine. There are over 90 different pneumococcal serotypes. Each of these have the capacity to cause a serious infection. So it's, that's why it's really important to keep up surveillance. The other thing that's important is that anyone who's a parent knows that anything happens to your child or your baby, you blame yourself. And it's very important to appreciate a parent's feelings around that and to be quite clear that this is not their fault. The first two days she was just laying there crying. And then that one day we woke up, she was just talking and playing around, moving around. I was like, oh my gosh, she's back. And then yeah, like she's happy right now, as you can see. She's just here. And then that makes me happy mm -hmm. that she's good. I mean, she's still recovering, but she's good. I know she's in good hands here. Hi, my name is Kelvin, and I work on the team that creates the content that you've just seen, Medscape TV. If you like the content and want to see more, click on the button to the right, and it'll take you to the full series.